Well, no, my, no, my, hurry, my. Um, welcome to our last uh, regional strategic uh, leadership committee meeting. Um, we uh, have we started the recording. We've started the recording, and just to note that we are still running under the hybrid uh, model, uh, and will be until um, the next council resumes. Um, yeah, and for members who are joining us online, which we have uh, Councillor Apanui, Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie, uh, Count, uh, Tubutayo um, Cranwell and Councillor Ian McKenzie. Uh, we've got, um, yeah, so just to note that, um, put your hand up if you need to ask a question, your silence will be taken as agreement. We have a quorum. Um, there's been no change to the order of business that we have in front of us. Uh, and I will ask Councillor Pauling to start us with a mihi, uh, followed by a karakia from uh, Councillor Southworth. So over to you, Craig. Oh, tai te mutai parikawai mahanui ki te paupau o te raki hauiha, pupu mai ka hoa tāwhiri mātou whakapuria, te awahoka o te whenua pākihi waitaha e a tihei mauri ora. A te mihi tua tahi mihi ki nga ātua kaharoa, a hoa mai o kaha, O mai o arawa ki a mātou i tēnei wā i nga wā katoa hoki, ai e nga atua tēnā koutou. A ka huriau, taki whakaaro ki nga tini aitua, ai e nga mate, a o ia marae, o ia taki wā, o ia motu, a haere, haere, hariatura. A rātou ki a rātou, tātou ki a tātou te honga ora, a ko taimai nei i tēnei rā, a i tēnei kōmiti, a tēnā koe te tiamana, a pida, a Koutou katoa, uh, Rauranga Tera Mā, nga kai kaunihera, nga ringa raupa o te kaunihera nei. Uh, kia korua, uh, Kauta, Alice, uh, nau mai hara mai kei wangi nui a mātou i tēnei, tēnei wā. Uh, ai, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou. So I'm um, just standing to reiterate the welcome from Peter and uh, yeah, welcome everybody. Great to have Alice and um, Kauta here, uh, all of our staff and councillors and Watu te rākau ki a Councillor Southworth. Mō te kara kia. Kia ora. Kia ora. A whakataka te hau. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kine kine ki uta, kia mā tara tara ki tai. E hi aki ana, te atukura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, hi hei, mauri ora. Yeah, kia ora tātou. Um, <coughs> thank you. Uh, we have an apology for Megan. Uh, for Councillor Hands for lateness and Mr. Chairman, I have uh, got an appointment soon after this too, so I'll need to leave here as we we'll be up In anticipation that this will go past up us too. Thank you for that, Phil. Um, but according to Councillor Sunkel, it will be all over by half past one. So we'll see how we go. Um, and also, should I say that. Um, uh, Chair Huey's had to step out for a, an appointment, and I'm not sure whether she's going to bat. So we'll we'll just see how we go with that, uh, Christina. Um, oh, and apology from Nicole Marshall. Thank you. Um, are there any conflicts of interest? Um, so item four, public forum deputations and petitions. There aren't any public. Uh, forum deputation and position to extraordinary business. I'm not aware of any uh, notices of motion. I'm not aware of any notices of motion. So we'll go to point 7.1 on the agenda. It's on, on your page eight. Uh, any matters of accuracy uh, relating to the minutes of the meeting for that date? No, so there's the, so could someone move the recommendation that's on the screen, please? Thank you, uh, Councillor Farm. Thank you, Councillor Southworth. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, that's carried. Moving to 8.1, um, which this, in, this is on page 15 of your agenda, Regional Strategic Leadership Committee Resolution Status Report, um, and Taflin, handing over to you, Taflin. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is really just to be taken as, as read in terms of the resolutions. Um, all of them are have been progressed um, other than two that are noted on page 19. So one is in progress um, regarding the waste. 
the Joint Waste Committee, and that's an action for the new council coming in. And then the other one, which says at the moment, which is the MOU with the University of Canterbury, which we hoped would be signed um, in this triennium, so before um, the elections, that isn't going to happen now. So that has been handed over from our chair to the chief executive to pick that up again with the new council. Um, and that's sitting with the University of Canterbury. We were just waiting for dates to come through. So that should be signed reasonably quickly after the elections. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, is there any issues around that report? So that's the resolution here. So the resolution is on the screen. So can I have a move for that, please? Thank you, Becky. Thank you, seconded by Councillor Edge. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, that's carried. So 8.2, so Coulter and um, they put in Sakoda, and if you and Alice would like to come to the table. Hmm? Oh, and Kimberly. Sorry, Kimberly. It's all right. So, welcome to you two. Um, it's good to see you here, and welcome, Kimberly. Um, so, I'm in your hands, Kimberly. Do you want to talk to this report, or do Colter, or Colter's going to talk to this report and Alice? So, Colter. And, Push that. Cool. Um, <laughs> kia ora, ko Coulter Crossanaho. Um, I just to reiterate uh, for anybody who might need a wee reminder, uh, I am the current chairperson of the ACAN Youth Rofu, um, and Alice is uh, also a representative. We're both from the Christchurch South uh, Ward. Um, yeah, uh, I might just yeah give a quick quick summary uh, of the paper. I know it's meant to be taken as read, but just to uh, simply just sort of gloss over it again. Um, yeah, that today is kind of the culmination of attendance in three or four meetings of this committee this year. Um, and we are yeah, in the final stage of formalizing the relationship that we're seeking with this group. Um, and yeah, the process that has happened so far has led us to um, yeah, the request of two uh rslc youth members um, that is our primary goal with this um yeah we're basically uh, if you don't recall from our previous um presentations at these meetings uh, we were just seeking uh, more capacity and support um, to participate in the, in a capacity or in the yeah decision making or sort of a yeah, in the RSLC context, um, we just felt that it wasn't really serving us well before, and we noted that we wanted that the council or the committee had an interest to um, engage with EYR, and we did too. So, yeah, we've um, come up with this proposal, and yeah, basically all the details are there um, in the paper which we submitted. Um, I might just, well, we've got a couple sort of, we read over it again yesterday and just wanted to add, add some additional clarifications to a few points like for instance um, I'll just start about giving a bit of background on the decision to recruit within the Roku. Um, so that is essentially the two positions uh, we're keen to recruit those uh, the candidates for those positions on this committee from the Roku because we feel that um, the the committee members who will be placed in these positions need to be thoroughly familiar with ECAN processes and um, just experience in the youth advocacy space. Um, that is kind of my personal anecdotal support for that is kind of um, involvement in the in the EYR. My impression is that some people um, get involved without really knowing what it is. And I think there's always an aspect of that. But um, I think for someone to be really successful, it's pretty important that they know what they're getting into. And so there's no and I, yeah, I think by recruiting from the EYR and having sort of a requirement to have been in the ROPU for at least a year, then we'll sort of reduce the, those risks of someone, yeah, um, signing up and and not really knowing what they're in for. Um, yeah, the the uh, the other sort of issue to talk about in this area is the um, the sort of bias uh, that we're carrying through from the ROPU. And we, we've just noticed, and, and since the formation of the group, there's been a uh, sort of inequity and um, through through the 
through the recruitment process um, and just that we're not particularly representative um, uh, across a number of sort of metrics. And yeah, that's something that we feel needs to be addressed at the beginning of the of the ROPU process. So yeah, we kind of view the, the ROPU uh, participation in that group as a bit of a, a chance to sort of put your feet in the water, see if it's for you. Um, and then what we're keen to do with Alice and I's work within the, the governance hoy is to sort of um, yeah offer a bit more of a staircase of of skills for people to progress through once they are sure that yeah it's for them. Um, but yeah, we're very aware of the of the sort of the representation or the perhaps the lack of representativeness of the group. And yeah, we really came to work on that, but we feel that it needs to be something that happens in the EYR's recruitment process. So. Yeah, we're not keen to address that issue with these roles, these RSLC roles. Uh, kia ora, Koto. Um, so part of this uh, submission is we've really recognised that we want to make sure that this is a collaborative process and how we're working through like the finer details. But one of the aspects that we want to like, work through is how committee members feedback to the youth ROPU. And we want to talk about maybe sort of deliverables of the representatives for a requirement, say like quarterly reports or feeding back about after these meetings. So the ROPU has an understanding of what relevant um, discussions are being had here. Um, and we're also talking about developing connections with other youth groups. So we're not just restricted to um, the EYR um, perspectives. And then we've also noted that there's a challenge for commitment with youth for a three year term. So with uh, the youth ROPU has acknowledged that the current recruitment and democratic processes have an inherent bias against youth in a transition trans transitory state of life where a lot of like youth don't really know what they're going to be up to in the next year, let alone in the next three. Um, and so we felt like measures need to be taken to offset that bias. And we've referenced them in the report in regards to having a two year term and opposed to a three year term, which aligns with our youth ROPU uh, term. And we're also wanting to detail how the process for handover would be between the youth committee members where there would be hopefully a crossover period. So any knowledge gained from the youth uh, on the committee can be passed on. And we're also talking about how what benefits that might provide to the council as well with having a youth member who has been on the previous council and then the um, experiencing a new council as well and what sort of uh, experience they're able to bring to the table with that. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing I'd add on to that is just that we are very aware of the, the learning opportunities from the um, the youth members in other committees, such as the intergeneral intergenerational member in the climate change committee and youth participation in the water zone committees. And um, yeah, we feel that a potential shortcoming of, of those roles is a lack of um, feedback to to the youth ROPU and, and yeah just connection with youth across um, Waitaha generally um, so yeah I mean I, as Alice said like I think it would be really a really cool aspect of this of these roles would be that it would just be kind of like a way for um, the elected youth committee members um, to sort of be a sieve for like youth relevant content basically and I think yeah that could be really powerful um, yeah uh, and then the only other thing I was going to add is just that um, we're really keen to develop the specific details, like the nitty gritty stuff around like the exact figures for compensation, the exact deliverables, um, and, and just like all that like fine detail with with this group, the EYR, and with ACAN technical staff um, with relevant experience in developing the parameters of these kind of roles. Um, but yeah, I think that's I think that's all we really need to say. Are there any questions? Yeah, look, good. Thank you. Look, I'm conscious that um, most of the discussion with you has been with myself and the chair and also Catherine McMillan from staff uh, point of view uh, in consultation with Kimberly. So um, 
getting ourselves to this point of time and making a decision to give to the next council is quite a big step for any council going forward. Um, and the challenge, I guess, is how we build the relationship and what is our expectation of you. Um, but having having you having introduced that, now's the opportunity before we uh, put the motion to seek clarification from councillors of you of some of the some of the points that you have brought up. So, are there any points of clarification sought of Coulter and Alice? Just before that, I did. I feel like I forgot quite a crucial thing, and that is in the last meeting and the pre preparing this paper that we put forward, we talked about how in the next term there may not even be an RSLC um, committee at all um, because that's something that will need to be decided by the new the new council. And so, yeah, sort of the first as the first paragraph of our what we are proposing is that maybe the roles aren't for this specific committee, but just in something kind of a similar capacity at the discretion of. Um, yeah, the next council, I guess. Yeah, that's a uh, point well made. It's actually in our recommendation, and um, we are conscious of that that we're not committing this specific committee to anything, but rather the council to having a conversation in the next training. This clarification from any councillors. Thanks, Colter. That's that's very good. Uh, just uh, two things. Just clarification on. You mentioned. Um, developing connections with other youth groups. Is it your intention to um, engage with other groups prior to say coming to this meeting so that any thoughts that they may have is, you know, what's the process of transactions in terms of uh, information sharing or, or question sharing? Um, yeah, that, that's a great question. That's something that we actually just discussed and that Alice was quite keen to to work on. Um, I think that, yeah, in, in this in this report we talk about uh, like pretty defined deliverables, so that we can, um, and we're we're keen to define those collaborative collabor collaboratively <laughs> with the with the group, um, because, I mean, my kind of gut feeling is that the youth who are particularly interested in the issues discussed in this meeting are probably the youth that are already in the environment Canterbury Youth Group, um, other youth advocacy groups around. Um, around in the region, um, you know, have slightly different focuses. But yeah, I think, for instance, like we have a network through Youth Voice Canterbury, which is like kind of a, a joined group that represents all of them. And I think through networks like that, we could sort of say, hey, look, we've got these roles. We're keen to d define like how they interact with other groups and like if people are keen for that. So it would be, yeah, we need to figure that out. And but like once we yeah, have actually decided that the roles are going to exist, then we can sort of progress on that when we have like a good relationship with some of those other groups. So. Hey, oh, sorry, Grant, keep going. It's just supplementary. Um, yeah, so the other the other question was in terms of the deliverables and things, uh, in terms of uh, uh, terms of reference, um, is uh, how, how do we handle that chair? I suppose it's it's really is that what's the thought between um, or is that simply that you coming up with um, a plan for deliverables and um, that then gets assessed by whoever at a later date and whether the terms of reference get, get such a to that. I, I think this is um, we, we're seeking um, approval to move ahead with this uh, piece of work. We've had informal conversations about the, the hard things that we would expect from youth and they would expect from us. And one of the things that Colt has um, um, articulated here today is the fact that, you know, we're not, we haven't probably got the representation that you'd like in youth rugby at the moment. So that would be one of the things. But in, in terms of specific terms of reference, I think that's something that once once we know where we're headed with this, we can go with Catherine McMillan, who can work with Kimberly uh, and work with uh, Colter and uh, Alice and the group and, and bring forward. Oh. Um, yeah, basically my or the group's feeling for the desire to have like sort of firm deliverables as just to be able to really quantitatively decide, like define what the role involves for people putting their hand up to be in it and also to um, sort of have a bit of a, a grasp on like if the requirements are being met because there has been some concern expressed around um, like just a bit of a sort of vagueness of you know perhaps in the water zone committees like 
you know, people not like youth members not like speaking up enough or contributing enough. So we're just kind of keen to get rid of any ambiguity and just like say, you know, like, are you meeting the deliverables or not as much as we can? Of course, obviously, there's like plenty of flexibility, but that's kind of where that arose from. Yeah, I think one of the other things that we need to do is try and provide some sort of a pathway for youth to move forward. Uh, Councillor Ian McKenzie, then uh, Councillor Mackay, and then Councillor Sunkel. Ian. Thanks, Peter. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the concept that, uh, uh, well, well the, the concept really of um, why, you, why we should go with you rather than any other youth groups. Uh, um, across Canterbury, and I, I understand that you think you, you've got a, a better understanding and a better interest in things, but I'm not sure that, uh, given that we're a democratically elected council, and yet uh, you're, you, you would then have a privileged position as being appointees uh, to, to any, any committees that we have. <laughs> um, and, and so I'm interested in, in, in how you, uh, how the youth ROPU, uh, how you select your members and how you... Uh, 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 what what opportunities there are, for example, uh, uh, the Southern Colts rugby players to join your youth ROPU or the uh, boy racers who I was talking to at um, uh, uh, McDonald's at 11 o'clock the other night, um, the 25 young fellows there who were um, who wanted better parking and so, or what they actually wanted was race strips up Rickard and Road as far as I can know. How, how, how do I how do we know that what you're representing is is different to all these other youth groups that are around the place? Sure. Um, yeah. So I guess I'll start by just kind of talking about how we how we recruit and, into the ROPU. So basically, that process is anybody who's interested um, puts an application forward um, with the sort of portfolio of their skills and experience and why they'd be good for the role. Um, that information is then uh, assessed by uh, this. This is in our terms of reference. Uh, sorry, our foundation document. Um, so the decision of the who the ROPU is composed of is made by uh, an ECAN staff member, um, a former member of the ROPU and uh, a counselor. Yeah, so that's a uh, it's a bit of a, in some ways, it is a bit of a black box. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of been the the process. And um, yeah, I think there are there's some improvement to be made. I think primarily um, we need to make more of an effort in the way that the roles are advertised because I think that we should, you know, be getting 500 applications and then having that process just, you know, really make sure that, um, yeah, you know, we have the right people in the group. Um, yeah, to be honest, the point that you've raised is a pretty like divisive one um, within within the ROPU and, and in developing this proposal, because, yeah, totally um, there are there could be someone out there who's who's really um, skilled and, and would really suit the role. And I think that there could potentially um, in developing uh, the like the specifics around this process, there could be um, grounds to say that you know, in some special circumstances, if there is, you know, evidence that someone who has not been involved with the ROPU would be um, really well fitted to this, then that is a potential. But um, yeah, for the reason that I outlined before, um, I think that, yeah, it is, it is the right decision to recruit from within the ROPU because, um, as I said, yeah, we the requirement of being involved in the ROPU um, for one year and, uh, you know, therefore becoming familiar with the the processes by which this group, for instance, operates um, is pretty essential um, because. Oh, well, essentially, what I'm saying is that someone who would suit this role is going to be someone who's interested in being involved with ECAN youth engagement um, because this is a sorry. Yeah. So, so if I just cut to the chase, I, I, I get all that because you said you, you said all that in your first introduction. But the, effectively, the youth youth ROPU, uh, you're selected by uh, people who want a t certain type of person there, probably a certain type of political agenda, uh, to to sit there. And then now you're thinking Matt, that Matt, those we're people. Looking for we're looking for clarification. We're I'm, I'm asking for clarification as to who sits on the youth ROPU, Peter, because from, from what's what's been described is that there's a quite a selection process there to make sure everybody's uh, uh, conformed to whatever is whatever the um, expectation is of those youth workers. Is that what I'm hearing? 
Yeah, that's what you're hearing. Cool. Thank you. John. Oh, I mean, clear. Thanks very much, um, Holker and Alice. You, you've mentioned bias around the youth refuse selection, which is basically touching on probably what um, Ian's just talked about. Um, recently, I got an email saying that the youth refu was apolitical, and yet rooms like this are political. And, and I know that you presented a very good submission to us for our annual plan. How do you have somebody sitting at a table such as this that represents all of the youth rather than their own position? Have you thought about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think. In the same way that you represent your constituency as well, because we're representing the voice of our group. And I think it's inevitable at some point that there's going to be a balance of your personal views and your group that you're representing. But I think at the end of the day, you've got to choose where your how you view your role. And I think arguably that there could be councillors here who have their own political opinions and also like your back or that like your constituency that you're representing. And that's the choice that you choose to represent. So I think our discussions would be based on an overall like discussion with the Rapu, hoping that that's reflective of the wider Waitaha youth yeah. voice. Uh, uh, just touching on the point that Alice made before about um, sort of, yeah, a big part of this uh, effort that we're making is to sort of counteract that um, just the kind of the bias in in our system of representation that sort of disfavors people and and states of their lives like Alice and myself from um, you know entering the council by the the typical elected route um, it's just yeah there as you know as we can see by the representation in the room currently um, there's a there's a bias against um, people who are a bit younger and perhaps at a less sort of settled state of life, I guess. We're not going to push on this too hard. I think you've given pretty good answers so far. Claire, have you got another clarification point that you need here? Well, yes, the reference was made to us being elected at the table. I'm just wondering, has the youth rapu looked at the elected route option? Absolutely. So that was what I was just meaning is there are a number of uh, us in the group who, who could proceed by that route but um yeah as i said you know it's um in terms of uh you know uh, i'll just an anecdote for instance like uh myself i was looking at you know uh putting my hand up to to run for regional council but um you know speaking to councils in this room they were saying i wouldn't really i really wouldn't recommend it because of your career your you know reputation because you I have been at university and haven't had a job or, you know, like it's just, yeah, we, I, my personal feeling is that we're at quite a disadvantage um, in terms of participating in the system that we have for electing representatives. We'll just go to John and then, um, we'll, yeah, we'll go and then we'll move to the motion. I, I guess I was seeking some clarification of why do I put myself through this election cycle of all the crap, the abuse, the whatever, hang everything out there to get elected to this council to represent everyone in my community, and you should just be appointed. And so there's a, a clarification, a challenge there. We have a youth ropu, which is in a privileged position. We don't have too many of those committees where we have folk come in, where we fully engage and have those conversations, engagement and issues brought forward. Other sectors of whoever don't. So again, just, just wondering, again, sort of clarity, privileged position with the youth ropu that a bunch of other folk don't have. Um, uh, point, point. Yeah, Point. I just, I just think the irony of why should Councillor Sankle, point taken. Uh, point taken, and we're going to move on. Oh, I mean, I'm happy to respond. Um, uh, just sort of tracing back to the beginning of the reason that we're actually seeking this mechanism, like the, the, the first paragraph, is just because we feel that there's an aspect of, um, one, of, of not enough support to engage meaningfully in, the, in these matters, and that there's, you know, on the RSLC website, it says that the group has a desire to 
or that the group is actively engaging with youth and we just feel like that there's not enough sort of commitment behind that to to actually sort of firm up that and and say that that youth engagement is really happening to a meaningful level and so we we need to find a mechanism to to make that happen more meaningfully we just want to sit at you know on a similar level and be able to feedback in a way that that works for for us but thank you um thank you for your answers uh and um i'll ask you to now step back from this we will put this motion and then we will have a discussion uh before we vote on it so the and I'll take your advice on this, councillors. There are two so there are two parts to this motion. Once we get it up on the screen, part one uh, recommends the incoming council when council committees or similar structures are formed following the 2022 election. Two youth Rupu members are appointed to the regional strategic leader committee or an alternative appropriate committee or structures. That's one. And the second one is recommends to the incoming council that such roles include voting rights and appropriate financial compensation. So I'm more than happy to take them together or or one and two. So sorry, 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 do, do, sorry. Can you just listen to what I just said? I just said, will we take these as one and two together, or will we take them separately? Great. You want to take them one? Together. Okay, so I have a mover, which is Lan, a second, which is Jenny. All those in favour? Oh, sorry. Discussion. I just pulled just about pulled the trigger on that one. Lan. Yeah, thank you. And thanks so much for Colter and Alice and the Youth Rawfu for bringing this to the table. Um, I just want to address the kind of why the Youth Rawfu and remind us about how we got to this situation. So, we as council have established the youth group in an understanding that we want youth perspectives to be we want to be more informed about youth perspectives um but it seems like we're putting sort of i would say unreasonable expectations and confusing our own obligations with consulting with youth generally we sort of it feels like we're trying to make the youth group fulfill our own obligations and be the voice for all youth everywhere, which they're simply not and could never be without them almost having the same exact structure of this own council behind them in a specific youth council. Like, I just think that's a unreasonable expectation and it doesn't make sense. Um, I think the fact that we establish them in the first place above other sector groups, for example, um, who have other opportunities to engage with council in various ways that we engage with our communities. Um, this is something specific. Then the youth will who have, we've asked them, um, how can we work better together? How can we feel, how can you feel like your voice is actually being heard? And this is a proposal that's on the table in front of us. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to thank you for doing that work and for really taking seriously um, that encouragement. I think as well, um, there's been comments about, you know, the youth law group being in a privileged position. And I guess in a way they are, but they've put themselves forward. Like this is all voluntary stuff that they're taking the time to engage with, you know, the regional council's business and questions. Um, I think we're privileged to have them here in any capacity and if they want to step up that capacity um, through a more formal way, um, I just couldn't encourage that more. So I'm so yeah happy to be able to move this, um, and I encourage council to get behind it. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'll let everyone have a say here. We're not going to do the three three thing, uh, understanding orders. Um, so just to check that I've got everyone on the list. So I've got Craig next, then Liz, then Vicky, then Grant, then Jenny, then. John, then Phil. So, great. Cool. Hey, um, thanks so much, uh, Colter and Alice and Kimberly, for your work. Um, you had me at um, that in the recommendation. Um, look, I think what you put forward to us is a really sound idea. The stats you've used about the population um, been under how much of Canterbury under 25 and that they don't normally 
get um, a council position is a great one. Totally true. Um, and we're talking about, you know, you've been appointed to a, a committee of our council, which you can do under the Local Government Act. Um, we have our two Grahams on Arthark and we've got um, we've got people, uh, we did it with our Timu Tyo as well last uh, term, or this term, sorry. Um, so yeah, we're not talking about them going on our full council because you know we can't do that. Um, so yeah, I just I'm, I am real stunned, but like Lan with you know some of the questions of our youth property members when they're actually ours, we established them and uh, we've wanted them to come and bring us this feedback. And I think it's a really great proposal, uh, a really good way to formalise and value the connection between our youth property that we set up um, and with the the networks that they have out to the the communities and their communities of interest. I think that's a really a great way to just get them involved more, get them understanding what we do as a council. Um, it's obviously going to have in the future great succession uh, for future councils. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, uh, you know, a good a ground for people to learn about what we do. Uh, that's a great criticism of this council that we that people just don't know what we do. So what a what a better way than doing it than bring our youth involved so they understand and they can share that with others. And hopefully we don't scare them away too much and that they do want to come back and potentially stand in our elections in the future. Um, and yes, of course, they could be elected if we wanted to pay for those elections. So yeah, let's um I'm I'm happy with that, but that would be our decision to make, not the youth world boost decision to make. Um, but I don't know if we'd want to get rate rates to pay for that. Might be a bit too much for some people. Um, but yeah, and I think what a yeah, what a great proposal. Fully support it. Um, and there's no cost implication on us right now. There may be um, a small financial cost to come for the next council to decide, uh, but that's not what we have to worry about today. Um, so in terms of the uh, the recommendations and to support that going forward. I wholeheartedly do. I think it's the best way to go forward for the youth world. A great evolution of what we've created, a uh, great next step, and I hope there's more to come. So, yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yep, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Calder and Alice, for this proposal. It is really, it is really good, um, and I fully support it. Um, and I just wanted to point out. Um, it's something something quite interesting. Um, I think Ian gave a really great example um, of a logical fallacy. Uh, we use an extreme example to shift the argument to that, and I think that you handled it really well, Coulter, which bodes really well for the for the future. So um, my comments really are for those of you who don't support inclusion of youth reps on, on, on our committees. I know that for you, it does seem like something different or new. It seems like a departure from our business as usual. Um, we've already done this, though. We've got Naitahu reps. Um, they weren't elected. We've got a youth member on our Climate Action Committee, on our Water Zone Committees, and other countries like Wales are going down this path. And the re reason they're doing that is because we're not living in ordinary times. So we can't keep on with our business as usual approach. It's not going to work. We are at a point in time where the actions that we take right now are absolutely critical to the well-being of future generations. And for that reason, we must have intergenerational representation at the table. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation and the paper. And um, yes, yeah, certainly I'm supportive of it. Just to go through some of the um, pushback in terms of um, biases in, in the, well, to, uh, first of all, to your point around biases in selection, that's well recognised and that's, that is equally valid accusation or criticism of this table. So those of us sat around this table have been able to have the financial resource to put ourselves up for election. It's not a zero cost process. We have to be able to accept the salary that comes with councillor, which is for some, if it's, it, you know, it's it's not necessarily sufficient to um, have a family or not family on. It will be off putting to people who are the primary breadwinner, primary breadwinner. So there is so there is an issue for standing um, and, and you've demonstrated that. Um, in terms of um, 
the criticism around having people who aren't elected. Well, we just as Liz as, or Councillor Mackenzie's just pointed out, we have that around our table already with um, certainly the Climate Change Action Committee. We had experts come on and also a youth representative. And that's because having differences of perspective, different experience, different knowledge is actually really important to make good decisions. So, you know, I think that one, that's not a good reason to not include you on the table. Um, in terms of, for me, this is like a positive discrimination. We really do not have representation around this table of a broad range of backgrounds, broad range of life, uh, age, experience, race, ethnic, like all those things. So it's really important, I think, that we, we, you have to have a degree of positive discrimination. In my experience, I didn't used to think this as youth, as a younger person. I thought, you know, women, for example, could just have all equal opportunity. We, we know we're living in an equal world, but I actually realised that that was completely false and that's still false. So, so um, you know, and, and, and let's look at the numbers for ECAN candidates at the moment. 31 candidates, nine women. So, you know, 100 years on since we were able to stand for election and we're still not equal. Um, so it's positive discrimination. It's breaking the status quo. It makes change to business as usual, which we have heard time and time again through three years that that has to happen. Um, and ultimately, it's a three year trial. You know, it'll be three year trial through the next term of the, as, a, as a committee is set up that, that does broadly what this does. Um, what's everyone scared of? What are people scared of? Like how, how we, you know, it's a test. We see how it works and what contribution you can make and you're given the opportunity to do it. Um, and it's worth testing a different way because we certainly haven't got everything right so far. So thank you for your time today and for your proposition. Yeah, Yuri. Sorry, Ginny, I cut you down. Okay. Oh, this is all right. I'll, I need to get a bit of my own treatment back, don't I? Um, so um, I want to say thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Good work. And congratulations for stepping up in civil society and putting yourselves forward for a youth raw poop. Frankly, this is a strategy. This is not a new strategy. I've known of these strategies for 50 years of my working life. It's a strategy we used in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s, and again now. The reason is that we need to redress the voices around our table. That's precisely why the 2001 legislation for local government allowed us to do this. And unfortunately, councils around New Zealand have used it limit in a limited way. It's now crisis time. There's planetary overshoot around every factor you can imagine. We're going down the gurgler as a human race, being able to survive on the planet. We need those voices at our table. What better way to give youth empowerment opportunities than through our youth raw poop? The research over many years has shown that you also need to give youth, if you've got them involved, or any other group for that matter, who are being excluded by our societal norms, practice in decision making is to give them real opportunities, not just through a youth raw boot. Even though you've done fantastic work in that, you need to be able to put them in the decision making chair so they get some experience. And my belief is they'll take that with them with the life. They may not stand for election until they're 40 or 50, because that's the economic reality. But getting it as youth helps banker. Banker our society against more lack of decision making with youth voices in there. So I think it's a fantastic way of learning for youth and I totally support it. And it's about empowering youth and good work. And congratulations to all the people on the last council who set the youth raw poo up in the first place. And thank you to staff who support the youth raw poo. I think it'll really pay out for the future. It's a, it's a work well done. It's future looking and it's exactly what we need. So I couldn't support it more. So thank you very much. Thank you. I've got now I've got John, then Phil, then Claire, then Ian. Have I missed anyone? Grant. Have I missed you, Grant? I, oh. Thank you. I, I don't support the recommendation that's going forward. If I could speak to the, the privilege of the youth rope, I, I see that in, a, in an honourable space, not a pejorative space. It is an honourable um, I guess privileged space of being there because it is one of the very few committees where we do take a group of society and we absolutely have those conversations and then bring those thoughts through to council. So for me, Youth Roku, brilliant, it's there, it is what it is, 
and, and it should remain. But I think we conflate the youth ropu with the conversation or aspiration of then bringing people to the table and putting them in decision making places on committees. And we stated it's not the council, so it doesn't matter. This committee has decision making powers. And so I'm a wee bit done with the continual appointment of people to committees. Every time I pick up the phone in this election space, I get hammered because of how we are operating with, uh, I guess, people appointed to, to council. So for me, Youth Roku, absolutely 100% conversation, iteration, um, but appointing to a committee, I just think that's a step too far from my view of democracy, simple as that. Yeah, th thanks very much, um, Coulter and Ellis um, and Kimberly. Um, I, I support um, the recommendations. You know, this this is Environment Canterbury's youth ropu. It's our ropu. They are appointed from a selection process, a nomination process, um, which for all intents and purposes is an objective process. Um, it's, it, there's no need for any election other than um, appointing with internally within the youth ropu. If the members are uh, happy to put uh, two people forward, um, in a way that's their business. And I note on item 12, page 22, that youth ropu also has two positions on the youth ropu for mana whenua representatives, and they too uh, are able to um, participate in, in the appointment process as well. You know, this is part of participatory democracy. Um, we have people's panels now set up as well. Um, they, they've they obviously said that um, uh, they're representing uh, the youth ropu group. So that's really good. They're, they're independent. They've got their own voices that they can um, talk, talk to us about. Um, you, you know, those comments about intergenerational things, this is why we're here. This is part of our role. It, it's we are mandated to think, to be forward thinking, intergenerational thinking, and the the issues that the planet is facing means that if we don't deal with these and understand some of the concerns of our youth, we're going to miss the boat. And business as usual, old fashioned thinking uh, needs to change. Um, and so, look, I, I make it go on, but I'll just, yeah, I'm supportive of this, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, next, Claire. Thank you. And then Ian. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you, Calder and Alice, for taking the time and staff who've worked with them to get to here. But you will have gathered that I can't support this today. Um, I indicated by my questioning at the previous meeting that I had some reservations around that. Um, to me, we, Council has the problem here. We've heard that, you know, they feel that they're not getting heard, they not haven't got the mechanisms in play to get their voices heard and, and to the degree that they wish to participate with us. So to me, that's Council's got the problem. We need to actually try and fix that. I don't see this um, having people being appointed to this committee or something similar in the new triennium as being the complete answer. I just want to refer back to the extremely good work that um, the Youth Rapu did in providing the feedback to particularly the latest submission and the previous submissions around our annual plans and long-term plans as well. And I think you did such a great job there because you acknowledged the diverse voices that you were representing at, at the table. Um, and that's what I'd like to see. Um, I am concerned with the view that those of us that are elected um, to the table uh, aren't impacted or don't have the same degree of implication from the decisions as young people, because we sure as hell do. And I think the other thing is that does concern me is that there is a view that those of us who are elected live in a little box and we don't actually have anything to do with our children or our grandchildren or our great grandchildren and understand the world that they actually live in and see things in. And I think that's very unfair if we don't acknowledge that. And I mean, I've just heard some comments, which I just won't repeat from the previous speaker, which is quite concerning. So in in um, 
sort of closing out, I really do agree with Councillor Sunkel saying that the Youth Rope is a really important committee and it's got a really useful process around a, a place to play and around the training space and understanding what environment Canterbury does. It is a replication of the council. Um, but I do not see it as a as the mechanism um, to get people sitting at this table as the pathway for them to go further in a political aspiration or understanding. So I'm sorry I can't support it today. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ian McKenzie. Uh, thanks, Peter. And look, th uh, um, th thank uh, the Youth Rope people for coming in. Um, but look, uh, I think there's some misunderstanding going on here about what, what democracy is. Um, I'm elected to represent my constituency um, and everyone who's eligible gets to vote. That is actually democracy. Uh, I'm charged with uh, 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 representing all my constituents, regardless of my, uh, regardless of their age, their demography, their race, or their uh, uh, or their uh, yeah, their age, and that is regardless of who I am. So this concept that because I'm an old, uh, I'm a stuffy old uh, conservative, that I don't, I can't, and don't represent the interests of all our constituents, all my constituents. Is, is a fallacy because that's not how democracy works. And we're judged on how well we do that every three years. And I may be judged harshly because, and, and that's what democracy is about. Um, I, I and, and as Claire has just said, we interact with young people. Uh, well, I interact with young people in my electorate on, on an almost daily basis, uh, whether it's at the rugby club, whether it's at schools, or whether it's at other other groups of young farmers and those sorts of people who I'm interacting with on, on, a, on a frequent basis. So to suggest that the youth or the younger people's voices aren't being heard or represented at council, I think is, 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 an, inaccurate, is an, an inaccurate description. Um, I'd, I'd push back on those who are saying that positive discri discrimination is the way of the future because that is not democracy. Um, subjective appointments to, uh, with voting rights and and being paid to be there um, on political issues, which is what we're talking about here, not not specific um, ex areas of expertise as the two Grahams are on the uh, Audit and Risk Finance Committee, um, is not democracy. It's actually screwing the scrum. So my position is I'm against the, the recommendations as they're put out. I'd be very happy to support uh, Youth Ropu sitting in on all the council committees meetings, uh, council committees uh, with speaking rights, but I'm against them having voting rights because that is a distortion of democracy. And I'm actually uh, against them having compensation because then we're paying people to distort, uh, distort democracy. And when I was a young fellow, when I was at university, I was on a, um, a variety of committees, admittedly with a, with a leisure bias. So, so I was the chair of the uh, students um, Alpine Sports Club, which then in my role, I ended up being chairman of the uh, Craigieburn Ski Club because we had a rolling um, right to the, the chairs, right? There were four clubs at Craigieburn and, and each club has a every four years gets the chairs role of the whole club. There was no suggestion of compensation. You did this because this is what you were doing. You were serving your community. In that case, my community was my fellow uh, university students. Um, and and we represent our constituents because we're serving our community. I haven't heard any of these comments, for, you know, from a, a group of people who are appointed through a selection process to make sure that they all conform to whatever the standard is for the youth roping. I don't get that these guys, you guys, are necessarily representing the the wider community of of young people. And so to to be paid and to have voting rights uh, seems to be totally inappropriate. Um, and and uh, one of the other fellow councillors has just basically said democracy needs to change. Democracy is, I think, isn't it been described as being the um, uh, least worse of all uh, systems, uh, 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 electoral systems. But it is, but it is the least worst. And anything, any distortion of democracy, which is what's proposed here, is actually going to a worse position than we already have. So I, I'm sorry, I'm, I can't support this because I'm a huge fan of uh, plain and simple democracy. 
Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Meg. Um, so we'll go to Megan, and Megan will be the last. Oh, and sorry, and then Phil. Megan. Thank you. Um, quite conflicted on this because I do really appreciate the work that the Rocky do it does, um, and um, that there are some incredible young people that show up to our table and through the Rocky. Um, However, like others, I can't support this recommendation. Uh, and the reason for that is around um, the democratic element. And I think, um, you know, look, when I first ran for local government, I was 25, um, was elected to a community board, and it is a shame that we don't have community boards for regional council. Um, you know, our zone committees in some way fill that gap a little. Um, but I, I do think that that's, that's a good opportunity um, there with, with community boards for, for younger people to participate in a way that's less um, labour and, and time intensive as well uh, and gives you the opportunity to sort of cut your teeth in, in politics because this is politics. Um, and um, it's when we think about appointing representatives to committees and I acknowledge that we have two independents on the finance committee, um, that's at the recommendation of the Office of the Auditor General. And it's in recognition of the fact that democracy doesn't necessarily deliver us uh, people around the table who are capable and competent enough to manage a budget of more than $200 million. Um, we have sought to have Ngātahu members at our table because they're a treaty partner to the Crown uh, and because we recognise them as mana whenua. Unfortunately, I don't see youth as of the same status. Uh, and so for me, um, I wouldn't support, but I'd also um, encourage, because um, there's been a lot of coming and going around the table around representation and democracy. And um, I think for me, adding additional independence uh, to committees is a dilution of power. And I don't say that as in a dilution of power of those who are elected, but it's a dilution of the power of the voter uh, because they have, all of the power when it comes to electing people. Uh, but when you start to change that model, uh, you are diluting the power of the voter. And, and that's one reason that uh, I feel quite uncomfortable when we, we hear these words about um, modernising democracy or rethinking democracy or things like that, um, because we're not talking about anything other than diluting the power of our voters. In terms of representation uh, versus people uh, voting on their conscience and their ability. When we come to this table, we swear an oath to represent all of the region. Um, and that's a model of representation. The trustee model of representation is one that, while Burke might not have been re-elected, um, I just ask members around the table to reflect on those historic speeches. And if you haven't read it, um, I will quote from back in the 1700s. Um, <clears throat> Parliament or, or democracy shall be informed by, by a member's knowledge and experience, allowing him to serve the public in the public interest. His unbiased opinion, his mature judgment, his enlightened conscience, he ought not to sacrifice to you, to any man, to any set of men living. Your representative owes you, not his industry only, but his judgment, and he betrays instead of serving you if he sacrifices it to your opinion. And that is something that I hold quite close. Uh, and for me, is about representing um, your good judgment when you're at the table, uh, rather than representing a specific political view or a specific thing that you're appointed to represent when you come to this table, because this table is about all of us working together for all of the region. Uh, and so to have specific representatives of specific political positions or specific groups is something that I'm not comfortable with, because it doesn't sit well with me in terms of um, the trustee model, model of democracy. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for bringing this issue to the table. Um, <clears throat> as you all know, at this table, I always end up heading back in to who I am and where I come from. Succession is very important in terms of youth and looking at succession of youth coming through. And the only comment I'd like to make in terms of thinking of succession 
is in terms of whether this is the appropriate place for that succession. And thank you, Megan. This, um, you've actually shortened what I'm going to say because I actually agree with what you're saying. This is a governance table. And I know from where I come from that um, in terms of looking at using succession to its full capacity is to uppy those people through and ensure that they are ready to sit at that governance table and to make decisions at that table. So those are the only things I'd like to actually say, but just one more. My tahu has waited a long time to be at this table, and I don't think that it's appropriate for us to use Ngai Tahu as an example alongside other groups coming in through this avenue like this. I am proud to be part of a table that brought Ngai Tahu here and for that bill to go through that has put us in that role of that decision making place at this table. But I don't think that that is an example that should be used to enable other groups to come through. Thank you. Right, so we'll finish off with you, Phil, and then we'll go to the motion. Thank you. So, councillors, I'm very strongly uh, support these recommendations and, and been very happy to second them. Um, it does, I would point out to people, in fact, Clearly, with committees, most virtually all of the decisions are recommendations. There's no big deal, and it's been quite clear that we already have, for example, recommendations from the zone committees and from the climate change committees, and they they um, have representatives um, from young people um, and and other quali qualified people. I actually think it's quite um, belittling of the of the of the report to actually imply. That young people don't have and uh, wouldn't be qualified to sit at this table, um, and and I'm I'm quite stunned. In fact, that to, I didn't see the know the figure, but young people under 25 make up 43 percent of our population. There's been reference, you know, going going back um, to the 18th century, as to how uh, for a definition of democracy, but you know what? Yesterday was the 129th anniversary of Women's Suffrage Day in this country, in Aotearoa. Our, our women in our country were the first in the world to actually get the, have the vote. And so democracy did change, you know, and up till then, and I've actually heard an implication during this debate that in fact, you know, we would know, especially older blokes like me and a few others, we would know how to vote for young people. That was the mantra that was actually trotted out um, prior to women getting the vote. Blokes said, women don't need the vote. We, we will vote for them. We know how to vote for them. We know what they would want. And it's the same kind of, um, you know, pretty conservative, you know, died in the wall thinking, really. Because the, the whole point, too, about succession is extremely important. You know, young people will come to us next term demanding that we take some action on climate change. Well, wouldn't it be a great thing, actually, to have a really good conduit with young people so we as a council can listen to them and understand their concerns and look at how, in fact, we, we incorporate those? That might be democracy in, in this century. So th there's a lot, there's a lot of um, other councils have put in some very good um, points about why, in fact, we should do this. I am going to make one more comment, though. So there's been this comment that this, the, the Ropu group, the youth group, will be in a privileged position. Well, really, as if, you know, most of us have not had some privilege to actually be here. So I would say, look, forget that argument, get on with it, with the future, which is these young people. And I strongly urge everybody to support this today. Hey, Phil, did you want to say something? You're the move, Lan. Do you want to say something at the end here? Um, look, I just look forward to this going to the vote and I just want to reflect on one thing that I do think is a little bit sad that has been purported and that's the idea that raising or uplifting certain kinds of voices 
dilutes or reduces from other voices who are already there and I just totally um, don't agree with that perspective it's about the more our strength as we know across this region is in diversity of voices it's not about um, narrowing that so yeah look forward to the vote thank you so democracy in action everyone's had their say on this which is great um, and these are tough conversations to have in front of two young people who are trying their best to get themselves heard um, and I thank them for coming and being so resolute in their um, clarification of the questions that were asked them and I'd like to also thank councillors for their honesty uh, and the discussion that we've just been through now what I want to do here is I'm going to put this motion it will take five minutes because I want to talk to those two young people so the motion before you is on the table Oh, sorry, on the screen. Uh, moved by Councillor Farm, seconded by Councillor Clearwater. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those aye. against? Aye. Sorry. All those against. against? All those against? against. So we'll just against. do a right. Oh, do you really want I to do a division? Need a division. Let's sorry, do a sorry. Division. Listen, do we need to do a division because this is going to the next council? We can just do it by show of hands. Okay, division. So, Councillor Hands, Chair Huey, yeah. Councillor Farm, Councillor Clearwater, yes. Yes. Councillor Edge, uh, Timmy Tower, Councillor Lewis, Councillor Sunkel, Councillor Mackay, Councillor uh, Southworth, Councillor Pauling, right. Councillor Ian McKenzie, against. Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie. In favour. Uh, Councillor uh, Apanui, are you there? Abstained. He's abstained. Okay. So. Hi. Kia ora, Peter. Oh, yeah. oh Tumutai. Oh, you're back. Yeah, good to, see, good to know. So, Tumutai uh, Cranwell, you're in favour or against? Favour. Favour. Yeah, so that's carried 9-5 uh, with one abstention, so thank you for that. And we'll just break now for five minutes until quarter past. Thank you. I think we'll get get going again. Chair Huey has stepped out. She's got another appointment to go to. Um, and I think, Councillor Hands, you might be leaving early. Uh, and Councillor um, Clearwater is stepping out at half past two, so... So thank you. So I asked Emma uh, that we're on to 8.2 um, and Emma is going to introduce that. Uh, uh, sorry, 8.3 and Emma is going to introduce that. So welcome, Emma. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so the purpose of the annual report overview is to provide a summary of the annual report, um, which will come to the council. The full report will come in December. Um, for adoption after it's been audited. But we wanted to take this opportunity to provide a, a summary and an overview um, of the report. But um, it's not the full report. It summarises the uh, performance um, information against the 40 levels of service um, with some information specifically on those targets, which um, at this stage, subject to audit, have not been achieved. Um, the paper also takes the opportunity to highlight um, the work that has been achieved under the five portfolios um, for the financial year 2021-22. So it's that retrospective report of um, the period ending 30 June this year. So we just uh, present this information, ask the committee for your feedback, particular areas to be highlighted by the chair and CE in the summary and uh, any comments um, or additional information we will minute that um, to include in the final report and once adopted there will be a summary report for the community and will be published. So that's probably enough of an introduction for me. Thank you Emma. Um, we have had some um, notes that have been taken by Christina that have been supplied by you. I don't whether we should just before we go to uh, questions of clarifications. Um, yeah, we'll go. We'll go to you first. Of all. 
through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've sent my question um, in relation to um, its target 24.2, it's on page 33, to staff. And I don't necessarily need an answer today because I'm aware this is a summary of the report, but I just thought, especially because it is such an important target that we're not achieving, that information in relation to the, um, the landfill, um, the, la the landfill which um, has been impacted by floodwaters um, on the upper Rakai River um, near Peel Forest. And in fact, we uh, it'd be useful to have more information about that. I don't require it today necessarily, but I'm um, because I'm aware this is a, a summary report. Unless staff will have a quick answer, but uh, um, otherwise, I, I flag that to staff. Yeah, they'll bring that back to you. Um, so can we just get Christina to run through what she has because those points have been asked to be, or are you going to put them up? And then we can, you can see clarification of these. So these um, regarding the feedback and points were requested to be recorded in the minute for this meeting. If there's something that you've got that's not there, can you point to it or point it out? Does that take uh, account of the issue? Ah, thank you. <laughs> yes, the bottom one is there now. Thank you. So you are including that other one? Yeah. Thank you. Just just noting around the um, reflecting the recommendation in, in our deliberation minutes for the annual plan there, but they are there. The other point that Taflin's just made, if there's anything that councillors want bringing back to them that isn't here and they don't want recorded in the minutes, please also state that now or in the next 24 hours. Say. So. Oh. My point that I just uh, uh, briefly referred to is more than what is up for page 33 for service level 24 about an award for contaminants or the register. It's really about a specific site, but I'm sure the staff have made a note of that. Um, yeah, I had a series of questions that sort of lead on from the information that's coming in this report, so I wasn't sure that's not picked up up here, but I've sent the email through. Right, so so I don't know how do you want to do that in this meeting? Um, I mean, like, in some ways, I think it might be easier if we've got two lists going, so we're minuting what you would like to see in the annual report. But if that raises other things that you'd say you'd really like information bringing back on something, and we've got some of those by email, but also um, Council Clearwaters, then I can take those separately and we we'll, can bring those back another way. So, but for the minutes, we definitely want to capture anything that you'd like to see in the annual report. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you on board. The annual report comes to Council in December. It's not this Council, but it's the next Council. So it will be recorded. Your view will be recorded. For the next count. Okay. Yeah. What I'm looking at my, the questions that I've got that are from the report, one of them I think is potentially to do with the wording specifically. So it is relevant here. Now I look at it thinking about it again. And that was the one on page 36, bullet 10, but they don't they're not numbered, so it's like down a bit that starts in late 2021 and it's talking about the philanthropic fund and it talks about it will reduce the need for rates in some pro for some projects into the future and I'm just was questioning the way that's phrased because I would have thought that people putting money into philanthropic projects would want to feel like they're actually going above and beyond what the rate payers pay to do rather than it simply being an off you know oh they just pay less rates and we're just picking up the tab so I, I question the the way that's phrased and whether there's a better way of putting that but it's Yes, I mean, we can um, change the wording to reflect that and make that clear, clearer and that it could be rather than that it would necessarily um, reduce rates to make that point. So I suppose the, uh, the question a question in that is my my thought about that philanthropic fund and the reason for it was to go above and beyond. It's not and recognising that, of course, we can't get enough rates to do everything we want to, but this is actually going, it's to go above and beyond, not just a holding rates low. So that's, 
it, yeah, that was my understanding of the intent. So it's not just sweetening the language or playing with the language, but actually fundamentally is that, have I got it right? Is my understanding right that that's what the philanthropic fund is about? Um, through you, Chair, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely right. That was our understanding as well. So initial response is to make sure that we reflect that. So very much like um, Councillor Mackay's around the climate levy, we need to make sure it absolutely reflects what's already gone through through Council. So hence the wording change. But anything that's coming forward, um, my understanding as well around that fund was that it was for it might enable a project to move faster than rates funding alone would allow for. But again, that would have to come back through an annual plan process to say these are the projects to, out to the community and this is how we would intend to pay for them. And this might be through philanthropic funding. This might be rates, might be a combination of both. So we totally agree with your understanding of it. Yeah. Anybody else for clarification? So those points will be noted. Sorry. There's no more clarifications. Those points there will be noted in the minutes and we'll go to the recommendation now, Christina. Which is three parts, four parts. So that's pretty straightforward. That recommendation. Have we got a mover for that, please? Thank you, Councillor Sunkel. Second by Councillor Edge. Any discussion? Councillor Edge. Uh, I want to thank staff for putting this together and um, just remark really on the incredible amount of work that has been done over this last year in terms of uh, delivering. Uh, levels of service or partially delivering delivering them and uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous effort by staff um, across the board. I particularly want to um, talk about uh, page 34 which describes some of the items delivered under the Air Quality Transport and Urban Development Committee in particular the first bullet point that we consulted with the community on three potential new fare options to stimulate greater usage of Greater Christchurch public transport. And this resulted in Council adopting a new fare policy to be implemented in 2023. Uh, and that has been praised by our community. Uh, other things uh, um, have been done as well. I also want to uh, remark on the Greater Christchurch partnership work a, 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 a co-joint partnership with Selwyn District Council, Waimakariri District Council, Wakakotahi, Naitahu, and the um, um, health health authorities, um, and the establishment uh, in partnership with the government on the Fuka um, Kanaki uh, Kayanga Committee, which is. Um, to strengthen the liaison with government on transportation and uh, housing issues, um, and also the development work of that of that committee in the 2050 draft strategic plan work, and a significant development of the proposed spatial plan, which uh, I understand will be presented for public consultation uh, in the first or second quarter next year. Um, on, and moving over to page 35, even though level 28 and 29 have not quite been delivered, um, in terms of 28, uh, there are implications there in terms of um, healthy homes projects. So that's really why that's not uh, completely delivered. Um, in terms of item 29, um, obviously public transport uh, services have been uh, vastly improved and the, and the um, incentivization of, of usage of public transport is pretty good. Uh, in terms of patronage, well, we've been constrained a wee bit over this last year with COVID-19, uh, but things are picking up rapidly, so that's pretty good. But the level of service was supposed to be greater than or less than or equal to 95%. Uh, we actually achieved 94.8%, uh, so we're pretty much on target, even though it's got a cross. Um, but yeah, all, all good and uh, yeah, well done. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Each. Anybody, any other comment? Okay, 
The motion is on uh, the screen. It's been moved by Councillor Sankel and seconded by Councillor Edge. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against. That is carried. Thank you. And Emma, <coughs> moving on to you for the um, 8.4, which is the work program. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so the purpose of this paper is to provide the committee with a high level overview of the work program for the Regional Strategic Leadership Committee. Uh, but this is really intended to be a sort of a high level snapshot of the work program. Um, a lot of the work under the committee, um, it's also reported through um, audit finance and risk through our portfolio quarterly reporting and as we've just discussed also would be captured in the annual report but this is intended to provide yeah, a high level overview and uh, that's presented in the table so that's thank you Christina's just, I'm just a bit lost here at the moment. Um, yeah, we can note in the minutes, when she's about to put on the screen there, um, which reads there was extensive conserva conserva conservation conversation on this report, and the following points were requested to be recorded on page 53 under program leading regional planning, consent, and compliance. <clears throat> RPS review as part of the Kai planning framework notes delay. Delays does not fully represent the, yeah, represent the work completed to date and status should be changed to ongoing. Now, I know that uh, Tumatayo uh, Council Lewis had an issue with the graphic. Does that help? It does. Thank you for that. So we will note this in the minutes. Anybody else? So we don't have to change the recommendation. Is everyone happy with that? Everyone's really happy with that, so that's great. So I'll put the recommendation up. Unless there's any discussion. So pretty, pretty straightforward. So we have a move for that, please. Thank you, Lan. Thank you, uh, Councillor Farm, Councillor Edge. Any discussion? No discussion. All those in favour, please say aye. All those aye. That's carried. So now to 8.5. Um, and again, Emma. <laughs> so thank you for this. And this is our submissions update, which um, is a great piece of work. Sorry, dear. We're just going to change the stuff, isn't it? All right. Okay, I'll get you to talk to that. We're just going to we have we changed the recommendation. Do you want to speak to that? Thank you, Chair. Um, so, as uh, you'll be aware, um, over the past year, we've really um, had a significant pace to the central government program. And uh, it's really um, have been a really significant number of consultations that the regional council have provided input um, into. So the purpose of this paper is to um, yeah capture that significant work program that's gone on and really report on this council's program of advocacy on really significant government policy and legislative changes. And so this is really to record that and uh, and the opportunity that this council has taken in sharing uh, our expertise and experience um, on those significant policy and legislative matters. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's a really good record for this uh, council. Um, it doesn't, um, I guess it doesn't um, relay the angst that went into some of these things and the time and the discussion that went into some of them, but it is a very good record for this council and a lot of work by staff to get this uh, to this point in time, um, uh, get these through and, 
and as we will see, there are other submissions that are pending. Um, and, and, and I think they've been dealt with in the in the paper about how they're going to be handled. Now, I, I, is any is any clarification sought around this? It's pretty straightforward, I think. Oh, Megan. Just a question, and I won't be here, so it won't matter either way. Um, just we've done significant work in this space, and it's been really good. I'm just wondering, um, moving forward, whether there'll be uh, for the next council to review for the engagement and advocacy strategy and um, plan for for moving forward with this space, because this um, has been a period of quite heavy reform, um, hence the number of central government submissions. Um, but obviously it doesn't quite that's going to change. Um, and my understanding is that this council has been far more active in that space in terms of wanting to submit on things than perhaps previous councils may have been. And so whether that's something the next council wants to do, just wondering whether there's a plan for a review of that or uh, some planning around that. Thanks. Um, yes, we will constantly have a look at how we respond to this and, and our submissions process. I had a look at some of the figures because all our submissions are published on our website. Um, this is for the last year, but if we compare calendar years in 2020, you know, in, in 2020, 2020, we made seven submissions. Last calendar year, we made 18. And this calendar year, we will be tracking similarly um, to that figure. So, as we've observed, a really significant number. So, we will um, keep our eye on what's coming um, and how we respond to those and constantly review that. But from a council point of view, and this may be not looking too far into the future, Megan, I think one of the things that we were advised with staff was to do these things in, in, in person as often as we could got the opportunity to do a number of them online, which gave us the opportunity then to have a better discussion with uh, select committees um, and the people we were submitting to. And where we could do, we went and uh, did them in person. Now, I think that that's paid really good dividends for us um, and the feedback that we've had from those committees. And, and my recommendation, if it's worth anything, would be that we need to continue that because I think that, that gets you know that gets you face to face with the people that are making all the decisions, which are the central government people. All right, thanks, Emma. Um, I'll get you to step down now. That's good. Um, I'll put the recommendation up on the screen. It's pretty straightforward, this recommendation. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Um, there is a meme being made to this, um, which basically just lifts the the first line of under background on page 54, there's a recommendation. And then under the first line under background, uh, it, it's added to inform and influence central government policy. And I think under a discussion that we've made that. It's a staff, staff advice. It's staff advice that we should add this. It's, this hasn't come from council, in other words. After discussion, that's the advice that we were given. Someone would like to move that? Thank you, Claire. The seconder. Thank you, uh, Council Southworth. All those in favour? All those against? Karen, thank you. Thank you, Emma. And and special thanks to Nancy. I don't know if we mentioned Nancy who did all the work, who did all the work here. And unfortunately, we were going to get at the table, and unfortunately she's not here. So if you can thank her on that. Oh, you you're online, Nancy. So thank you, Nancy. I didn't see you there. Um, thank you for your work here. It's been a really good piece of work and all the research you've put into that. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, wasn't quick enough for a discussion on it. Um, just, just, qu just quickly to say, um, I've actually thoroughly enjoyed the submission, participating in that submission process. It was fantastic, and the calibre of the submissions and the staff and preparing those was absolutely ex exceptional. Um, so, look, it, it, in terms of upskilling and uh, increasing your knowledge uh, about what we're supposed to be doing in this um, in this space uh, was really excellent. So I thoroughly endorse the continuation, as you suggest, uh, on this kind of process for next for next term. My apologies to councillors that looked around the room and we were going to run out of a quorum, so I was wanting to rush on. So <laughs> thank you for that. Can we just uh, anybody else want to say anything on that? Um, 
Thank you. Uh, can we move to 8.6? Now, I understand that, Dirk, you're in the room, but Jude's going to introduce us. Jude? Jude's online. Yora. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can, Jude. Go ahead. Sweet. Um, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to um, bring this paper to you today. Um, you've got Dirk uh, Brand in the room, our um, Manager for Programs and Implementation. He's the facts, figures and our reporting guy. Pla uh, him and the team play a really important role in our ability to publicise and show the community the work we're doing in relation to compliance and incident response. Um, it was December last year we brought these annual reports um, to this committee. We've brought them a bit earlier forward this year um, and they're in a slightly different form. Um, some of the work is done undertaken by Dirk's team and programs and implementation around the desktop activities relating to compliance monitoring. But the feet on the ground are in our zone, located in our zone teams, so our incident response officers and compliance monitoring officers. So I guess that's who's delivering the work we've got here. Um, the other factor I just wanted to touch on was um, the two reports are, are different in nature because they reflect different aspects. Incident response is very much a reflection of our reactive work when issues are identified often by our community coming in a variety of forms, phone calls, emails, um, snap sends, solved, etc. Where our staff respond if they can in a prioritised way um, to, to look at verifying what's going on and addressing the issues to ensure we're minimising environmental harm. Um, the facts and figures speak for themselves as far as quantity of calls and our ability to actually go out in the field and follow those up. The second report relating to compliance monitoring is much more our proactive approach to monitoring consents, conditions and performance, and they align with our prioritised um, CME um, that, that, that we've talked about previously in this com committee. So that's much more of a sort of forward work plan of where we in intend to go out. But it also is obviously refle reflected in the figures as the legacy issues of things found the previous year, um, how we're going um, following up on those non-compliant from previous year, as well as uh, monitoring new consents as well. So that's just a little bit of overview of understanding the proactive and reactive nature of those. Compliance monitoring is 100% cost recovery to the consent holder. Um, when it comes to incident response, we sometimes can recover costs, but often we can't, and that's reflected in our prioritised um, programmes of work as well. So um, Dirk might be able to answer, um, is on hand for answering any specific questions, but I was taking the rest of the report as read. Thanks, Jude. Um, Dirk's being very shy, not coming to the table. Um, <laughs> so, are there are there questions of clarification for Jude uh, Grant? Uh, yes, uh, just thanks, Jude. Eight sixty eight. There's a chart there, and I'm just wondering if you could confirm the nature of um, grade C or C grade items discharge of water or discharge to water and use of beds in lakes and rivers. They're both uh, one's 10 percent and one's 11 percent. If you could explain what the general issues are involved in those items. Um, I'm going to defer to my colleague uh, Dirk. I'm sorry, what page was that on again? I've lost uh, page, my page 68. OK, I'll look that up. Dirk, do you have a response? I'm just finding the page. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, page 68, is that the one on incidents? Yes. Yeah. It's the one on incidents. I'm particularly just uh, querying uh, the nature of the incidents um, involved with C grade. Uh, the 10.2%, uh, which is referred to discharge to water, and 11.3% use of beds and lakes and rivers. So would you like to understand what's the difference between the grades? No, just the nature of the of the events or the nature of the incidents. What what are they, you know, like what type of thing? Uh, so, um, 
sorry. Uh, so discharge to water will be anything that's discharged into a, a stream or a lake or a river, so any pollutants. Um, and the use of beds uh, of lakes and rivers is normally clearance, so vegetation clearance that's uh, not allowed by our plan. Um, or any disturbance that's not allowed by our plan. So for, in most cases, you need a consent to dig a trench, to clear vegetation, and to disturb anything close to a, a river or a stream. Okay, great. So, so in respect to those, um, there's obviously something's reported and you've investigated and, and then given it a, given it a grading. Uh, correct. Every uh, every complaint is investigated, assessed, and uh, and then when it gets a, a moderate non-compliance, which is a C, there will be an investigation and an act, action plan uh, to deal with that uh, issue. Chairman, the the second set is related to the compliance monitoring report. And um, I'm particularly looking at page 74. And page 74 has some percentage of inspections, um, and they are quite high for Selwyn, Waiora, and Ashburton. Similar figures of around 24%. I'm wondering if you could just clarify um, in, in our C or D compliance rating. What's normally involved with with those issues? Uh, so, uh, Councillor H, I refer you back to page uh, sixty one. So that's the priorities that we've taken to council earlier in the year, um, which is high priority consents, water use monitoring, farming land use, fish screens. Uh, the reason why we got a high percentage there is uh, our uh, focus lately on territorial authorities. So in both those zones, we had non-compliances in the case of our territorial authorities, wastewater, uh, water use, uh, provision of water data. So uh, that's in line with the priorities that you've given us. Elizabeth, do you have a question? Huh? Yes, yes, it is a question. Um, it's also on around that same page, page 68, um, showing the incidents, and it looks like you know they're mostly compliant, mostly A, quite a few B. But a lot of our environmental baseline data is showing continuing environmental degradation rather than improvement. So how do you do ground truth? ground truth this data around compliance with baseline data that we have. Um, how do we how can we tell whether it's our rules that aren't quite strict enough or whether it's our compliance and enforcement enforcement that isn't quite strict enough? I'm sorry it's a bit of a big question, but um yeah. I I can have a stab at answering that if you like. Um, I think one of the one of the important things to recognise here that this is compliance against the provisions that are in place when it comes to incident response. So often it may be what does what what do our plans allow for? So um, there is that aspect around certain things will be permitted. There's also um, it for incident response. So often this is where our permitted act activity monitoring kind of ends up being captured um, rather than in the compliance monitoring um, report. So, so there is very much a base of what does the plan say, not so much, um, although that's balanced with the immediate um, environmental effects that are occurring. Does that make sense? Um, I think I probably need more, but I'm happy for that to be um an email or something, I realise it is quite a, a, a big thing. I might send through my questions by email at some point. Thank you. OK. I can maybe just add to that. Um, when we do the review of the plan, every 10 years an op 
look at the new plan or drafting a new plan, we consider the effectiveness of our plans and rules. And therefore, we change the plan to address those issues that wasn't addressed in the previous plan. Ah, that's the answer I was looking for. Thank you. But I'll just add on to the end of that comment, which is, of course, ultimately the compliance part is what actually delivers. So the plan can be as great as it can be, but if the compliance part doesn't work, you don't move forward. So it's great to see this work done. Um, the question, I've got a few questions. First one is, um, it mentions here about monitoring consents and compliance with plan rules, which is permitted activities. Now, permitted, if you if you comply with the rules, you don't need to apply for a consent. Mm. So how do you how do you monitor that? How do you is there a strategy? Do you do just like drop in spot checks or you know how do you monitor permitted activities to make sure that they are actually genuinely compliant and actually don't need a consent mm -hmm. at all? Shall I go first or are you happy to? Um so it's a really good point, um Councillor Southworth. What we what a consent tell, tells us is where something is happening and often when, whereas a permitted activity, we often don't get visibility of when the activity is happening unless it comes in as an incident response. And I think crop residue burning in South Canterbury is the classic example of that. We don't get told in advance the location of where that activity will be happening because our plan doesn't require require that. So therefore, we, you know, our staff are out there trying to follow up. Um, but not knowing the location. So I think there's a real challenge. One of the interesting um, that makes it difficult for us to know when, a, when, where and when permitted activities are happening and are they then meeting the threshold of that or exceeding it? You know, is the environmental harm occurring or not really difficult? This has been identified within the RMA reforms, of course, because they're, they, um, the requirement for more notification under permitted activities is one of the themes that is coming in to that new legislation. So I think that my reflection on that is it identifies the the gap, if you like, of, of that category um, to enable better monitoring in the future. That will, you know, that'll create some onus for us in the future as well as to where we store that information, etc. But I think that the change in legislation to consider that reflects exactly that point. Maybe I can just add most of the complaints that we're getting, uh, the officer will go out and check whether it's a permitted activity or not. In most cases, uh, it is a permitted mm. activity. However, last year we did have a uh, 200 over 240 breaches of permitted activities that was picked up in that way and with also with visits to to uh, certain sites or the, uh, inspections or during inspections so we do pick that up and then the NAS for forestry also require there's also a permitted activity that we monitor there I think it's over 300 of those activities were monitored last year so essentially, it's the community is actually a really important part mm. of our ability nice. to hence the instance responses. Um, in terms, that, that was another question I then had was: so you've given the number of incident reports that were responded to in the table, and I'm just wondering how much, how many actual incidents were reported? Like, what percentage have been responded to, rather than? Yeah, what's because it, it, I just got on the table how many responded to, but not the total number that came in. So the, the quick answer is we've responded to everything. We've assessed everything and therefore we got that as a response. Um, last year we had uh, over 4,300 complaints logged, but in some cases we got five complaints at one site or for one event. So we see it as one incident. So we follow the MFE guideline on how to uh, identify an uh, event. Um, so, uh, so the five, uh, the four thousand three hundred turned into the number that's in the report, the three thousand seven hundred incidents, and we've assessed all of them. Uh, and in some cases, uh, 
a desktop assessment indicated that it's complying with the rules. Uh, those that's not compliant goes to an officer which will decide whether to investigate or not. That's good. Um, on point 18, there's a paragraph that gives percentages for the consents that were monitored and graded. Now, if you ignore those that are still in process um, and just work out the percentages based on those that have actually gone through the process, process of assessment, then 20% are either moderately or significantly non-compliant. That's one in five, which sounds really high. But I wonder, have we benchmarked that? Do we know how other regional councils are doing in terms of their moderate and um, high significant non-compliant? I'd really love to know how, we, how we're going with that, because that sounds like quite a lot, given the significance importance of being compliant in order to deliver on all the objectives of our plans. Uh, I think uh, James Tricker did bring a report uh, comparison of all councils a while mm -hmm. ago, where there was a comparison mm -hmm. with other councils. Um, and um, yeah, compared to other councils, we we actually, well, we're very similar uh, with some of the larger councils. The uh, I think one of the things to remember is with the uh, focus on water data monitoring, uh, the number of compliances went up compared to what we had five years ago. Uh, and as you know, we've made some uh, improvements there in compliance by getting uh, consent holders to submit data on time. I think that's one of the biggest things. So it's not necessarily, it's a non-compliance, but not necessarily um, with an environment effect environmental effect because some of the data we get late. Um, but 20% is, uh, some of the larger councils are also at 20%. And we will most probably, there will be a, every year there's a comparison. So we'll most most probably bring that back to council when it comes next time. Yeah, I was going, I guess the question, if that's pretty normal, then the question is, you know, and I know we've been talking about this, how do we do better? Because that's doesn't sound great. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I also I did quickly look back and I'd forgotten about the, the briefing that you report that you mentioned. Um, but I did quickly look back to uh, some information we had on significant regionally significant water consents, which were overrepresented in terms of the non-compliance. And I'm mm -hmm. presuming like if it's just data not arriving quite on time, I mean, does that count as a moderate non-compliance or is that low? I mean, I just thought that was a low risk, but uh, that's a moderate is uh, because the, with the new regulations, they need to submit every 15 minutes uh, if you uh, take more than 20 litres a second. And I guess I could have a really It could. Yep. That's good. So it'd be great to have some, yeah, that next bit of data and that briefing or a report come back to the next council on those consent compliance and how we're improving or what we need to do to improve further. Thank you. I was going to ask a question, but it, it just builds on probably the comment that Vicky's asking for. I think the important thing is, well, you could you could look back and provide some information around the fact that we've got relatively modern plans, uh, perhaps compared to some other regional councils that mm. we may compare ourselves with, and therefore we're going to have more conditions on some of these consents. So that becomes more of a challenge when to be fully compliant, you've got to meet perhaps eight or nine conditions or more on some consents now versus some older types of consents or some that were relevant to older plans, which might have only had two or three. Yeah, I think, um, and that's why if you look at the number of uh, cases where we provide advice and education, 600 and, well, 671 case of incidents and 530 in the case of consents, that's why we've got a strong focus on that because we need to upskill, we need to train people, train 
uh, consent elders uh, keep them up to date with the latest information, which is a challenge if you've got an old consent. Uh, so that's why we spend a lot of time on that to uh, provide that information and advice on how to comply with consent conditions. Okay. Yeah. So go ahead, Meg, and then we'll go to the recommendation, if you don't mind. Thanks very much. Um, conscious of time, so I don't want to dig into it too much, but um, just looking at the consents monitored in terms of consent compliance monitoring, I'm um, really pleased to see that the farming land use consents are sitting at um, sort of 92% A and B grade, so, you know, you know um, less concern in terms of any of that but just interested when comparing the compliance data here um, for some of the others for example discharge of human effluent and discharge of stormwater those are 27 percent non-compliant and 20 about 24 percent non-compliant with potential for environmental effect some environmental consequence or significant environmental con mm. consequence Yet, when you cross-reference that with our monitoring priorities, stormwater and human effluent aren't in our monitoring priorities. So they're a lower priority in terms of our monitoring, but they're a higher, they've got a higher percentage of non-compliance. So just, just a question around that. Um, and I'm also, you know, sort of guessing that some of the incident responses are probably discharge sediment, discharge stormwater as well, because um, mm -hmm. they tend to be ones that get reported because they're very visual. Um, so yeah, just just a question around that. Given there's very high levels of potentially environmentally damaging non-compliance in both human effluent and stormwater, um, but we speak a lot about farming, um, who are who are largely quite quite compliant when you look at this data and when you look at our monitoring priorities. So can you comment on that, Joyce? Thanks. Yes, yeah, certainly. And I think if I uh, refer you back to um, item 14, you'll see that under high priority consents includes the territorial authority consents. So that's where the stormwater, wastewater, et cetera, are sitting. So they are captured. And you may recall a briefing we have done in this calendar year, I think it was, that gave a quite a big update on where all those TAs sat. And the, you might recall there was a fair bit of red and orange on the um, so, so they are a high priority um, in our priorities to focus on, and that is being done. Although I can appreciate because they're clumped in there with a whole list of others, you might it might not have um, come out to your attention. Yeah. Thanks for that, Jude. Um, yeah, just just on that, just seems still seems very high, and, and it's just not often discussed. Um, and not and acknowledging that we did have that briefing about the territorial authorities not being compliant, but um, yeah, it's. That's quite concerning to me that we have that kind of level of compliance, non-compliance that has an environmental effect rather than technical non-compliance. Okay, thank you. That's been a pretty good clarification discussion, um, I think. So, Christina, if we can just put that recommendation. In. Oh, if you, did you want to say something? Yeah. Um, sure, just going to... Um, 30 and 31, um, and under 30, it's saying that um, it is recognised. I just want to know, you recognise that this need for engaging with Papa Tipu um, under 30 and 31. Um, has there been any thought in terms of the action? Has there been any action on the ground? In what way? Are you looking to engage now that you've recognised? So there's several things at play. So there's instances where we have a good um, pattern of engaging and working with Papatipu Runanga. Um, tomorrow, sorry, on Friday at Te Paharinga, we are actually having a session there on this issue of compliance. So that's... Um, a little bit first of all around how uh, ensuring understanding of how we do compliance and then exploring the way forward to to look at that aspect so that's um just for some visibility that's occurring on friday thank you jude um so we'll go to the recommendation now which is there in front of us uh could have someone that want to move that thank you claire 
Seconded by Craig. Was that your hand that just went up? Yeah. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> Is there any further comment on this or any further discussion on this? OK, let's put that motion. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. All those against, aye. carried. Thank you, Elizabeth. All those against, so that's carried. Uh, look, that brings us to the end of this meeting. Um, we don't know when the next meeting will be. We don't know whether we'll have a regional strategic leadership committee. We do not know what's going to happen into our future. But before I'm going to go to Craig and ask him to mihi and then to um, to Vicky to get us uh, karakia out of here. But I'd just like to thank Taplin for her leadership with of this portfolio, um, and and also to the staff uh, Emma uh, Davis, Justin McLaughlin, Adrian Lomax, and, and especially you, Christina, for capturing the need. I uh, um, uh, wish you luck uh, for the future, um, and I'll be interested to see what you think when we come back, what this should look like. I really will. So, Craig. Uh, kia ora, Peter. Oh, okay, it's total koho to uh, mihi uh, ki nga kaimahi, uh, ki nga kaikoni hero hoki. Ai, uh, tēnā koutou o koutou mahi. A pana tene pomati, a tene mahi, a tena koto. I for a tutraco, capu, tricky. Unu here, unu here, unu here, unu here, kita urutapu nui o tane, ke watia, ke mama, tenako, titinana, te wairua, ite ara atakta, koira erongo, fakaria, ake kirunga, ke tina, tina, homie, huie, tai kie.